Welcome back to the Impact Driven Leader Podcast. This is your host, Tyler Duckerhoff. If you're listening, I hope it sounds great. If you're watching, I apologize for how I look. No, no, that's, that's a joke. I am glad you're here. So thankful that you're choosing to listen again, subscriber, whether on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're not a subscriber, hit that subscribe button. Get notified whenever new episodes come out. Man, I am excited to share this conversation. Kareth Foster. Kareth is a kind of a leader in the diversity, include, equality, and inclusion space. She terms it inversity, meaning inclusive diversity. I mean, honestly, if you go back to the episode with Chris Robinson last year, last season, we talked about this idea of like, I don't, I don't understand it. Kareth and I go through that. We go through the challenges that so many leaders have, but also some of the origins, some of the ways out. We happen to be recording this episode on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And it, it's fun to be able to overlay that and have that influence our conversation because, again, so many of the desires that Dr. King had was not for division, but inclusion, more people coming together, more people finding their place and from their value. And that's what causes real workplace diversity and really augments and creates a better environment for everyone. That's something that I've been led to believe and understand and see. And there's one common factor. One common factor that I think everyone focuses, when they focus on, it works out so much better. I'm going to tease it. We'll come back at the end. You'll catch on during this conversation with Kareth Foster. Kareth, thank you so much for joining me. I am um, beyond excited to have this conversation. I, I didn't quite mention this in the beginning um, when we were chatting beforehand. One of the great joys of doing this podcast is getting to meet and having conversations that ultimately I hope brings value to people because I get to meet people that I wouldn't have otherwise met. And I am so excited to have this conversation and really to see where this goes. I'm excited to Tyler. Thank you for having me. So one of the things that I want to start off and just, you know, your subject matter that you talk most about that you are really serving the world in is inversity. Yes. And I love how you've put that together. Uh, I love it because I've seen such confusion there where there's people are like, all right, well, we need to do diversity training and inclusion, but yet we're going about it in the complete opposite way that, you know, if we're going to note this day is, you know, January 16th, that Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Day, the very opposite of what he called people to do yeah. when he first went about it. So. Let's kick off there. Absolutely. Well, I, I thank you for even sharing that word because it is a new word for many people. People like inversity. What does that mean? And the reason I came up with that word is because even the word diversity, right? The root of it is div, divide, division. And then we're shocked when we call it diversity training or programming, and it has the opposite effects of what we want, which is bringing people together. So inversity is still taking that aspect of the diversity programming that is acknowledging, honoring, respecting all that we are, our background, our heritage, um, our identity, you know, what we bring to the table, but shifting the focus from what separates and divides us to what do we have in common? Yeah. How can we be truly inclusive of one another? But most importantly, and, and I think powerfully, how can we be introspective, right? Meaning understanding your value and worth so that you can then see it in someone else. Because we've been working from the outside in this whole time, right? We've been trying to change people's minds, right? Telling people what they should say, what they should think. This isn't about changing people's belief systems, it's about behavior, right? And, and turning the tables, going inside, making it an inverse scenario, where you're thinking, how would I feel to be on that end of things? Yeah. How, how would I, it feel for me to experience that? Well, let me apply that and treat somebody else the way they want to be treated, right? It's not just the golden rule of treat someone, you know, how you would like to be treated, treat someone how they would like to be treated, the platinum rule. So it's expanding that. And it's also, if I may, um, broadening the term of diversity, because I think we've kind of been caught in this, this paradigm of thinking that diversity is only about someone's ethnicity or their sexuality, 
and slash gender. Like that's far from what true diversity is. There's neurodiversity now, right? There's diversity of thought, diversity of ideas. The languages we speak are socioeconomic backgrounds. Like there are political views. There's so many things that make up diversity. And again, if we can focus not on it being about someone's belief system, but rather their behavior and how they approach one another, how we conduct ourselves in professional settings and conversations in our communities, within our families, then we're getting somewhere. And it, it, it's, you know, it's such a loaded conversation and topic, which makes it, you know, hard to speak about because you're like, well, can I actually go there? And you're like, I'm trying to like engage and like trying to think logically through this. But then there's this fear of like, okay, am I going about it the wrong way? Because I don't have the right perspective. And to me, that's that whole conversation. I remember years ago, um, I, I happened to get like on an alumni newsletter from Cornell University where I went. And there was a it, kind of a blurb where they're like, our admissions last year, we had a 15% higher um, admissions of minorities. And my initial thought was like, okay, so what makes that powerful? Either we were doing it wrong through our admissions process, so we had to change it, or we all of a sudden changed our admission policy so that way we, we now selected for minorities. Is that going to solve the problem? Or is that just doing to, you know, one, what we didn't like doing to the other, but in the name of diversity and inclusion and equality, it's okay. And again, even my mind having that thought and question, I'm like, that's really, that's, that's not right. And yet it's so hard to have those conversations because you're like, can I actually say that? Oh. Is it, is, yeah. is that okay? Is that yeah. kosher? I mean, all, let's say all the, the words around it and you're like, I'm just going to go be quiet because that's what I should be doing and is, that's is the happening. way I feel. Exactly. That's exactly what's happening. People are terrified. They're terrified of speaking out to say, look, there's an issue going on. We need to, you know, we need to talk about it and work through it uh, because then they're the troublemaker, right? They're terrified about saying anything of like, wait a second, is this really the right way we want to go about this? Because then they're automatically like the racist or the misogynist or the sexist or and it's, it's this no-win scenario. It's this catch-22 where now everybody's afraid to talk. So any issue that we have proliferates, right? And yeah. it becomes a powder keg. And uh, there is an organization, I'm not going to name names, um, who had a – and this is a worldwide, huge, like, Fortune 100 company – had someone come in to give a, a diversity talk, right, a keynote. Every single person in the audience walked out. I don't know what they said. I, I can't wait to get more intel. But every it, since then, they've not done anything with yeah. regard to diversity and inclusion programming because of that one instance. They're terrified. People are terrified of doing the wrong thing, saying the wrong thing. And, you know, a lot of what I practice, I mean, there are many things that go into the diversity conversation umbrella, but I talk about having grace, yeah. right? And that's not a word that we use very much professionally. We should just like be. love, you know, we're just starting to bring that word in. Like, it doesn't have to be romantic love. Like, I wish we could kind of go the way of the Greeks. Like, they have 14 yeah. different <laughs> definitions of the word love, right? <laughs> relationships. Yeah. Um, but grace, because, you know, we're humans having a human experience. We're fallible. We are not going to always say the right thing, do the right thing, react the right way. We're, we're, we're you know, we have to really cater to the fact that we're not perfect and that's okay. And if we could have grace in that and, and forgiveness, now that doesn't mean if someone repeatedly acts out or, you know, misbehaves or just, you know, cannot get it together, that they shouldn't be called out. But I actually, I prefer the term calling people in versus yeah. calling them out, Yeah, which does seem to be very popular with traditional DNI stuff. Well, that person said that, so they need to yeah. you know, be called to task. And okay, how do you learn best? When somebody like embarrasses you, when somebody like makes an example of you, when somebody punishes you, or do you learn best when someone like brings you in and educates you and enlightens you? Includes. Includes you. Exactly. I, uh, a great author who I love just because he, again, thinks so different. Malcolm Gladwell. I love him. Yeah. In one book, I can't remember. I think it was talking to strangers mm -hmm. in, in the book, Malcolm described how there was during the the racial tensions of the 60s, there was a, uh, a black man and a white man who ended up having this conversation. It ended up the white man was a Ku Klux Klan member. 
And they ended up having this very tenuous, then they became very close friends. And this white man was, uh, this black man actually, you know, ended up inviting him into his family because he got ostracized for having that relationship. And they soon found out they had way more in common because they were both raised in such racist homes, but yet one of them was pictured different than the other. And they realized, no, you know what? We appreciate each other. We actually have way more in common and appreciate each other based on values yeah. than we do anything from how we look, you know, the way that we dress, all those other factors that you could go down the litany of because they just wanted to be people. I, I think one of my favorite movies, Remember the Titans, where, you know, that was really kind of, again, at that crossroads. And it's like, it does not matter. We are teammates on the field. Why can't we be teammates and friends off of it? And yet the great thing that I, I've seen, and Brene Brown talked about this in the last couple of years, this is really powder keg, is this dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. And how dehumanizing through the process of, of diversity and equality and inclusion has created it to be so tense instead of like, I don't care what you look like. Mm -hmm. I don't care, mm -hmm. you know, what choices you make. How do you want me to treat you and vice versa? Let's start there. Let's start as people yeah. that we're all living and breathing and we have desires. Let's talk about that curiously rather than making these statements. How do you deal with that? How do you engage oh, in I that conversation? I love that you use the term curiously. And I always tell people, be curious. Like, we should be curious about one another forever. Because it'll, the expression I use is the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. Yeah. Right? And when we lose curiosity, we become indifferent. And that's going to be the downfall of society. Um, but something else that you mentioned, which really, you know, is a, a key component within university is, you know, what, what outside forces are telling us we're so different from one another? Like, where is this coming from? And a lot yeah. of it is media, now mm -hmm. social media, but on, on multiple levels, not just, again, about ethnicity, right? But, you know, male against female, yeah. um, straight against gay, you know, yeah. cis against trans, like all of this, like Democrat against Republican, all of these, these, these dichotomies, right? are coming to a head and we're supposed to pick a side, right? When we can run the gamut of all of those things, we're not just, you know, we're not monoliths. We're not one dimensional. Who is telling us we have to pick one aspect of who we are and that's it. That's that's why I honestly, I, I have an issue with the whole pronoun thing. Not because I don't respect what somebody wants to be called, but it just seems like it's just another layer of a way to divide us further yes. and siphon people into a category so they feel more isolated and alone, right? Why can't we just be people? Now, I lectured at Stanford University for some time, and I was honored to be asked to be a luminary for the Knight Hennessy Scholars Program. And while I was there, there was a gentleman by the name of Michael Spector, who's an adjunct biology professor. He's a writer for The New Yorker, and he was teaching a class on DNA gene editing and CRISPR, right? Okay. Which can be kind of controversial stuff. I can mean, be, yes. We're talking about either curing a painful, horrible disease like sickle cell anemia or creating designer babies, <laughs> you know? Like, wow. it I can mean, what, what's, what's even, uh, to, to add in another layer there, is where people, I think, are conflicted. And again, my background, they don't realize it's not in agriculture. And so when we look at, oh, GMO, it's like, oh, you can't do that. But you're like, well, wait a second here. This same technology is what just, you know, cured your loved person of cancer. Oh, but, 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 but. and again, that that whole mixed bag of like, oh, where it's do a we mixed go? bag, right? Like totally, totally. Um, but I sat in on his class for one reason. I mean, yes, I was curious because I'm not a big science person, but I love learning new things. But I wanted to know from literally the horse's mouth, how close are we genetically? as human beings, because, you know, in this field of, of DEIB, um, I wanted to be able to tell my audience, look, we're this much percentage apart, right? So I sat in, listened to him, he was brilliant, of course. Afterwards, I, I, I told him what I did and who I was, and I said, you know, what, what percentage are we really different from each other as humans? He goes, Kareth, we are 99.99986% the same. I go, wait, so wait a sec. I go, we're fighting over four ten thousandths of a percentage point 
Because in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, that's, you know, melanin content, hair texture, eye color. He goes, no, not even that. I go, what? He goes, that four ten thousandths of a percentage point has to do with your chromosomes and chromosomal anomalies. Like if someone has Down syndrome versus someone who doesn't. I mean, mind blown. And if people could, like, come from that perspective sometimes, yeah. of like, look, we are so not that different from one another. We are so much more alike than we think physically, biologically, value-wise, like you were just sharing with your story. If we could get there and we could cut that outside noise off that's telling us we're different. And that's challenging because, you know, you're going to really get off social media. You gotta really stop watching TV and stop watching the news and and look, I worked in media for t- over twenty years ago. I saw it like back in the day, and there was something that just didn't sit right with my soul. And I didn't know then how bad it was gonna get, but I knew that it was about luring people in. Yeah, it was about you know catering to echo chambers, right? It doesn't matter what network, and it's about fear mongering. And we are being told on a consistent basis to be afraid. Be afraid of people who don't look like you, who don't talk like you, who don't think like you, who don't vote like you, who don't love like you. Be afraid. We're not told to be graceful. We're not told to be kind and loving. At least not in that arena. Yeah. So how do we soften the blow? Like, how do we have the conversation to where... People can let down their shoulders. They can let down their guard to say, okay, yeah, I need to think about it differently. I need to think about it in that way. We soften the blow by leading by example. We soften the blow by stepping away sometimes from making it a personal experience. Like, I think it's very easy for people to be on the offense and for people to be on the defense. And that's usually what happens in a traditional DNI type of training or programming, especially the way that's been done the past however many decades. You're either going in and being told you're part of a marginalized group, so you will always be a victim, you will always have something done to you, done against you, or you're the villain and you're the perpetrator of all bad behavior. Yep. Okay. And the the victim has a makeup in that, like there's a, this is what the victim looks like. Yes. And then the villain, this is what the villain looks like. Yes. So before you ever walk in, not saying by actions or by what's done, the villain looks like this. Here's the stereotype. And the victim, this is who it's going to be. It's usually, you know, a white male, a female. It's a white male. It's any other race. It is, you know, again, you go through those stereotypes. You can continue to go around the world and it's differing, but overwhelmingly you start with the villain and the victim are already set before you have the cover conversation. And so that's one of the things we have to eradicate coming in with that mentality that there's all victims and all villains. Guess what? There are nasty, awful people of all colors, shapes, sizes, religious beliefs. Ethnic. I mean, it's just, you know what I mean? And there are good people. And I think, you know, again, what we're having to do is literally reprogram how we see ourselves and how we see other people. And and that's where the challenge is. If you're constantly being fed messages about, and I'm not saying we ignore history, right? Like this country is rife with some pretty, and when I say this country, I mean America. Yeah. yeah. Some pretty like dastardly, horrific events that have happened across the board. I'm not saying you ignore those things or like, oh, it's water under the bridge. It's, look, those things happen. Let's make sure they don't happen again. Yeah. Right, yeah. but this overcorrection of, of 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 doing the exact like I call it segregation 2.0. When I find out about these these areas that get created in in certain spaces, um, I mean, look, I, I'm not opposed to ERGs. I think it, you know, if there's a collection of people that want to gather and support one another, absolutely. But if we're talking about being truly inclusive, then everybody should be invited to be part of that. Right. You know, when I hear about these dorms that are only for one subsector group, it, it, it makes me cringe a little bit because I'm like, I get the idea of a safe space. Like, I get it. I get it. I get it. But I think we need to elevate it and have brave spaces. Mm. Right. Have a brave space where you're allowed to be who you are, to be your authentic self. But you're also brave enough 
to welcome in people who may not think exactly the same way or see exactly the same way, but you're brave enough to have the conversations and hear what may be uncomfortable. And this is across the board. It's not just one versus you know another. This is like everybody needs to participate in being brave because you know I think we get so scared. We want to be right. We want to feel validated. We want to feel sometimes even vindicated, which I think is happening with a lot of the DEI work, right? Um, but is it really changing the world for a better place? Are we creating healthier, stronger relationships? Or is it just flipping the script? And now there's an, an, another outcast group of people. Sure. Yeah, you, you change it from, well, one group was the outcast. Well, we're going to push against that. We're going to make a different group rather than rewrite, rewrite the whole process. One thing that, as you mentioned, this idea of kind of rewriting that, and, and I had a friend share this with me, and it, it just makes me wonder that, again, children learn, people learn um, from part from protectionism. When you think about it, real instinctive, oh, I need to be afraid of something, too, oh, falsely so prejudice and you know all of those things and i had a friend share this with me one of the great concerns about artificial intelligence is that's being written by someone and all of a sudden if that perspective is being written into the artificial intelligence that's the result we're going to get and all of a sudden now we start looking at this all right we want to change the narrative we want to change the narrative to have inversity to where our inclusion comes with diversity because we're not picking people based upon whatever metric you want to. We're choosing it upon something else, maybe values, maybe hobbies, whatever it may be. Those can be exclusive because not everyone has the same hobby, right? But yet they can be very inclusive because now all of a sudden it's a very different group. But yet if the if we look at how we're going to operate going forward and the concern is, oh, we're going to have this built into it by certain segment of people who chose choose to write the code, man, that's really concerning. Extremely concerning. <laughs> AI scares the hell out of me. I mean, I, I appreciate technology. I do, um, you know, the advancements that have come and the things that we're able to do in some respects, but there's nothing like good old fashioned conversation, yeah. eye contact, being in someone else's energy realm. Like, I mean, if we're talking about our physiological beings, um, literally the, 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 the energy that radiates from our hearts, from our souls, from our ethereal, it's like six feet. I mean, you wonder like, huh, why, why do they want us to stand six feet apart during the, oh, oh, maybe so we couldn't connect to one another? On top of, yeah, trying to keep his Z's away, but like, yeah. wait a second. Oh, because there's power in that connection. Totally. Right? There's power in that feeling that you are in someone else's energy, and it's very similar to your own, right? Being able to make an impact, being able to um, find a, a, a connection and a, a collaboration um, that you might not other, which AI does not offer. It just, it just doesn't. And it, it breaks my heart when... You know, people get kind of sucked into these, and I know it's been around forever, but like the kind of second life type things and the virtual realities, it's like the real world is happening right outside your door, right in front of you. Let's not be so scared of it. Let's not be so intimidated. Let's not feel so bad about ourselves. And that's a big part of adversity. And when I say understanding your value and worth, you know, I, I wrote a book called You Can Be Perfect, You Can Be Happy. Spoiler alert. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as perfection. Um, but the idea is... You know, happiness is a choice, right? Now, the caveat is it's not a constant, yeah. but it's a choice. And, you know, if we can get over the fact that we don't have to be perfect, the weight that that lifts off of our shoulders, the fear that that releases, that, wait a second, I'm not perfect. No, neither is anybody else. Oh, okay, we can be imperfect together and we can learn and we can make our mistakes, but we can bring that grace into play. And, and, and we can make this, actually, we can, we can find the happy in that because it's totally possible. Um, but if we're constantly living in a state of fear and then we refuse to even go outside of our house or our shells or our little glasses, I mean, what's the point? So with that in mind, this, this pursuit of happiness over perfection, 
how did you come to grips with that? I mean, how did you, as a, a little girl raised in Plano, Texas, like, like how did you work through that ultimately to say, um, this gives me a perspective that is very unique that I can really offer to people. I was caught between two worlds. So I don't know if you or your listeners know about Plano. Plano, Texas in the early eighties and nineties was very white, like very white. Like I starred in an all white production of the play A Raisin in the Sun. Okay, I <laughs> see. There were twelve hundred people in my graduating class from high school. Twelve of us were black. Like we were part of the one percent. <laughs> and what's interesting is, before I graduated from that school, I transferred to another school because there were more black students there. And I thought this is where I'll feel like I fit in because I always felt like, even though I had my popularity, my friends, like mm, you know, I just maybe if I just were around more people who were having my experience, it'd be different. But I went over to this other school where there were more black students, but. They didn't have the same shared experience. I came from, you know, a two-parent home, a pretty affluent area, and I got there, and I was basically told that I wasn't black mm-hmm. or black enough. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wait, wait a second, because I look in the mirror, and I, I, this is what I see. So what do you mean? And it, I, I was tortured. Like, I, I was bullied um, for the first time in my life ever by the group of people that I'm, like, thinking is supposed to be embracing me. And I had to – it was a, it was a mind, you know what? Um, And it really set me in a tailspin because I'm like, wait a second, how, why is anybody defining me just by that? And what's wild is that, you know, when I left for school, I went to school in Missouri and then England, and then I moved to New York and I started uh, in in broadcasting. I worked for The View, but while I was there, I started doing stand-up comedy and the same thing happened. Like people wanted to categorize me. They wanted to, to pigeonhole me, right? Well, what kind of comic are you? Well, She's black, but she's not like, you know, sassy and rolling her neck and talking about baby daddies. She's not like Monique or some more. What do we do with her? Like, people just didn't know what to do with me because I didn't fit the stereotype, Mm -hmm. right? So, again, it was this, wait a second. Why do I have to just be this one thing? Because you see it when you look at me, when I'm so much more. And and that really kind of was the, the catalyst, if you will, for the path that I went on to refuse to be labeled. To refuse to be pigeonholed and siphoned into a category. And yes, I'm black. Yes, I'm a woman. Those are two aspects of who I am, of which I'm very proud. But that's not all that I am. And when I go somewhere, I'm like, you know, I'm a comedian or I'm a speaker. And these other things are bonuses. Right? And I think if more people could do that, and I feel very fortunate that I was empowered enough to do that, A, by my parents who taught me to be proud of who I am and our background and our family and our heritage. And I did go to a women's college which was another kind of boon for like, wait a second, women can do anything and everything that a guy can do. And that doesn't have to define me as a victim again. Um, And so that was always my approach, which is why I think I have a success that I did in the pretty male dominated field of stand up and, you know, TV and radio, that kind of thing. You know, there's an element there. And I think about, and I think about a lady who is part of my community and we've talked about this kind of you know she is a high level executive and she's like i don't like the conversations about you know the the women in business or the quote girl power or whatever it was like i've never seen it that way i've never labeled myself that i'm pushing against that i'm just doing me because i didn't know any different i didn't know that there were supposed limitations on me so why am i going to speak against something that I've never experienced. And it, it's a great conversation to have because what's interesting about that is that lack of insecurity is almost like, well, there's something wrong with you. You should have that insecurity because that's what society says you should have. And yet there's someone else who, you know, maybe is, you know, a, a middle-aged white man who has a lot of insecurity based upon what value do they have? What standing do they have? What place do they actually have? Because they don't fit this stereotype model as well of being uber aggressive and it's super intense in, in this, you know, whatever style that an executive should be. And it's like, well, that doesn't work either. And I think, you know, I've seen this in some of your work and, and I really kind of want to use it as a stepping off is this idea there's nothing wrong with me so why should i think there is yeah 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 most people think there's something most people wake up in the morning look in the mirror 
and immediately start criticizing. Oh, look at that blemish. Look at that acne. Look at those rolls. Look at that. We say stuff to ourselves that we would never say to another person. And mm-hmm. B, if somebody else said it to us, we'd be like, who raised you? Yeah. And so yet we're expecting to take people who do that every day and have them be good to other people too. What? Of course we're failing at that. We can't even be good to ourselves. That's another, like, I mean, that's another layer of adversity. You have to understand your value and worth, not seek it from an outside source. And you have to train yourself on it because it's not easy. Not many people were raised being told how amazing they were, right? I'm raising two young ladies um, that I, I I mean, it's a challenge. You've got kids, you know, it's always a challenge. Like they don't come out with instruction booklets, but every now and then I'll pick up a nugget. Like, you know, one of the best things I heard recently was instead of telling your child that you're proud of them, you should say you should be proud of yourself. That way they are not constantly seeking that outward validation. Love that. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. what a beautiful nugget. And so I do that now. You know, they show me an art piece of art or, or they've made a cake. I'm like, that is, you should be really proud of yourself. I hope you are. Yeah. That's great. What, I mean, to me and as parent, you layer that in here, how we do how well we parent is a reflection of how well we're attempting to grow in our leadership ability. There should not be a difference at the same, like get frustrated, seen this is if you Lord over children, well, then you're going to attempt to do the same thing. You, you can't play one style of offense at home and then go play a different style. It, it is who you are. And if you want to have, you know, better children, it's like, well, you're going to treat people the same way and vice versa. There, there can't be an on off switch in. I love that idea of this, you know, again, coming back to the top of it, insecurity, which is an area where I've really tried to grow. And it, it's been a major point to have to hurdle to get over. And a lot of it was that understanding, well, the world didn't see me in the classical way of having value. I had different interests. I came from, you know, background on a farm and I liked all these different things. And it's like, well, it was always discounted. I'm like, "Uh, I don't know why. And I think as we talk about this again, diversity and inclusion and adversity ultimately is seeing those uniquenesses as great opportunities instead yeah. of mm, that's your limitation. No, that's your great strength. That's what is so unique and different. That's going to add tremendous value. Absolutely. Just like there are shadow sides to things, there are highlights to things. Mm. Right. And I think you know it's so much easier to get caught up in the shadow stuff. Like I, I don't know if you watch pretty woman, right? That yeah. classic movie, right? One of my favorite movies. And there's a really great and poignant line in there where she's Julia Roberts' character is lying in bed with Richard Gere. And he's telling her how amazing she is, how wonderful she is. And she says, you know, the hard, the bad stuff is easier to believe, right? And that's our default mm-hmm. mode. And so we have to reprogram ourselves and our brains to get out of that default mode. And there are things you can do. Like every time you say something negative, you have to say something positive at least minimum five times. Like I've read it up to 17. You know, but I try to tell my kids that too. Like, you know, because nobody else can do it for you. As much as I want to do it for my kids, as much as I want to do it for my husband, nobody else can do it for you. Nobody else can build you up. You have to take that on yourself. And this work is about personal responsibility. You know, how you show up to these conversations, that's on you. Are you going to come in as a victim? Are you going to come in as somebody who's always had somebody say something bad? Or they're, they're looking at my weight or they're looking at my my skin color, or they're looking at, you know, if I'm flamboyant, like, <clears throat> is that where you're going to stay? Or are you going to show up as the amazing, incredible, purposeful being that you are? Because if you weren't purposeful, if you weren't supposed to be here, you wouldn't, right? That's what most people don't know. They don't get that the fact that they exist means that there's something awesome going on. Yeah. Well, I mean, that is a, an enlightenment that the sooner we go through in life as, as people, as adults or whatever, the greater that we can get to understanding why our difference gives us great reason to be included because we can, we can be that different viewpoint that all of a sudden unlocks everything. 
And if we're trying to continue to mold ourselves, and I think that's one of the great frustrations. I, I get it sitting down as an executive and you're like, all right, we got to do this DI training because we're, we're, you know, got to do it. We got to be more, you know, diverse around here. And you look around the room and you're like, the problem is the people that want to do what we want to do all come from a similar background. Why? Because that's what they're passionate about. And so instead of, you know, picking and choosing based upon what people look like, well, why, you know, what different, what experiences do you have that maybe were different, same, want to be here and using that as an inclusion, because if we start relying on the, well, you can't do this, then we're letting someone else's perception again comes back to that ai programmer that's sitting there and saying this is what everyone will look like Mm -hmm. and instead of saying well no because i'm choosing not to Mm -hmm. and that that choice has to be on me rather than someone else dictating and saying hey all right Kareth, um, we need to increase our diversity here. So I'm going to ask you to come work at an organization because we need, you know, some difference here. Instead of saying, I don't have anything to do with that because that isn't an interest, isn't a passion of mine. Instead, go find the person that's super interested in what you're doing and don't care about their background. As people have shared that with me and I've seen that myself, it is absolutely amazing the diversity the, the true diversity in all yep. shapes and walks. Yep. And yet, I think where as leaders, it gets challenging is saying, how do I have the freedom to allow that to happen instead of being mandated, you have to force this. And then all of a sudden it doesn't happen and you have bad experiences. That, and that's literally at the crux of my work. I mean, I go in, I, two of the, I want to say, the biggest mistakes I see with companies doing diversity and doing it wrong. I mean, I, I talked to, you know, it, first of all, it's not a two way street. People think it is. It's a six lane highway, but the two okay. lanes that people get stuck on are the thinking diversity is just about ethnicity and gender sexuality. Sure. The other lane that is full of roadblocks and why everything blows up and there's like, you know, rear ending and, and accidents is because everybody thinks like, Having a successful diversity or diverse environment means that everybody thinks the same way and agrees. That's the exact opposite, by the way. That's the antithesis of true That diversity. brings problems. Right? Um, but what I'm seeing is with a lot of companies and corporations, they're either being corrective or protective. Mm. Right? Mm. So they're needing to correct bad DEI that's been done that's yep. caused more issues and polarization. Or they've seen bad DI happen and they don't want to bring that in and destroy the healthy culture that they have. They just want to keep the culture going, make it, improve it if possible. And that's the thing. I, I don't want to be seen as punishment. <laughs> like if something goes wrong, bring me in because you want a probiotic, right? Oh, bring me go. in because you want a vitamin B shot. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'll do for your company, and I will keep you going healthy and strong. I mean, I'm looking to eradicate the need for any kind of DEI programming. Now, it's an $8 billion a year industry, if not more. And there are some people who are very happy to keep collecting that nice paycheck and going back year after year because it's an evergreen business because they're not solving shit. Excuse my French. <laughs> no, sorry. they're making it worse. They're making it worse. And either they know and they don't care. Or they really honestly don't know. And like, why, why is this not working? I've been doing this. For, it's, well, that's the definition of insanity, right? Well, it, it's, it, it's our, you can go down a lot. I mean, we, we can make this rabbit hole real big. But it, it, it's the same solution in our world for healthcare. It's let's not fix the real problem. You used probiotic. You used those words. You started. All right, Kareth, you were really the one that that opened up. But it's that same mentality. It's like, why give me a solution that maybe is going to be more work and longer term? Because the reality is it's better. You know, you know, it's better. Better when you when you stop and you you know think about it a year two three years down the road and you said as a organization just like we're going to as an organization we're going to say hey you know what I don't care what people look like I don't care what background they have I don't care if they have a degree or not here are the six values that are really important to us as an organization here are the six things that are non negotiables now in most cases. Because if those are important to who you and your people serve, you know what? It's going to be pretty. 
it's going to be homogenous, but it's not going to be absolute because there's going to be a girl like you who went to the all white high school that said, where do I fit in? Because honestly, I fit more on my experiences and my background. And that's where I fit instead of being told, well, you don't, you know, somebody else said, well, you don't fit there. It's like, why? Like they were my friends. I got along. Oh, it was good. Well, you need to go somewhere different. It's like, no, I don't like, I'm not wrong here by saying I like it here. And you know, that can be many different ways and and cuts and, and swaths. And it's like, instead of that being wrong, that is right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of double speak in the world, right? Like you just said, you know, I feel like there's a lot of 1984 happening, (laughs) (laughs) right? Healthcare is really sick care because how many people are really actually healthy? Um, Diversity is really about dividing people up into groups and segments of society. So it's like, wake up everybody, wake up, yeah. see what's happening, what's being done around us. Let's be proactive. Like you said, let's say no more, no mas. This is not okay. I'm not buying in to this paradigm that you're trying to sell me that we're that different, that we're that separate. Cause it's, it's wrong. It's not yeah. okay. It's not okay. You know what? There's a, there's a, a bubble that comes into my mind. And again, this is uh, January 16th, Martin Luther King Day. And one of the things that he is noted for is not making it, this is a push for black Americans. He goes, this is for all people to have rights and equal and opportunity. And, you know, I don't, we're not going to shut doors to if you don't fit what we think you should fit in order to be marching here, to be able to be championing this cause. And yet here we are 60 years later and we're still trying to figure that out. And instead of opening and closing doors based upon what you look like, what you believe, where you went to school, how you did, it's like, what, what unique value can you bring? And if that's celebrated here, there's a place for you. And at the same point, if that unique value is not an opportunity for here, that's okay. Let me help you find the place that is. And using that pathway, again, it's gonna be longer because it's not, you know, black and white, you know, cut and dry. It's not A or B, it is, okay, well, there's a lot of different letters there. There's a lot of different gray area, but that's okay. And if we're willing to go through that process, you may find out, "Ah, this actually does fit me. Yep. Kareth, to bring this back in, you know, more to your heart and you think about, you know, and I've heard the story about your parents and the challenges they've had. And again, working forward and you think about, you know, as you mentioned your daughters, where do you think the great movement forward is from one generation to the next? to the third? I think the movement comes, it has to start with value, right? We've used that word a lot throughout this conversation, value in other people, but again, value in ourselves, right? Because when you value yourself, you're not waiting for the next slight to ruin your day, Mm -hmm. to go to HR, to take somebody down, right? When you value yourself and you understand what you bring to the table, you're not looking to keep somebody else down because you don't want them to get ahead because you don't think they're as valuable or worthy as you. Um, You know, so much of this, again, it it all ties in, right? Inversity and and perfect or happy. Um, When you're happy, when you're good with who you are, you're not caring who somebody else votes for or who they sleep with or, you know, what they eat for dinner or how they pray. You're, you're okay because you know that whatever they do, so long as like it's consenting adults and no children and animals are being harmed, everybody, it's okay. It's okay. Um, that doesn't mean you have to agree. It doesn't mean you have to share that belief system. And I think, again, that's a really hard part for, for some people to let go of, right? But I'm right. Are you? Are you? Who's to say that they aren't? in their own space. Um, but if we can get to that place, that's, that's where we excel next generation. 
right? And, and having an openness and an awareness. And I think really also relying on our intuition. Like one of the things that I talk about, it's on my website, is, um, you know, I say it's not hard work, it's heart work. Yeah. And the reason I talk about the heart <clears throat> and I, I bring this into play is because there's actual neuroscience behind it, right? Like this isn't just about changing someone's mind and you know their thoughts and penetrating here. The heart is more than a muscle that pumps blood through our body. The heart is actually a little brain. The heart has over 40,000 neuroreceptors that think and feel and reason independently from the brain, which is why, you know, and it makes sense. If someone's died, your heart is broken, right? You may know in your mind that they're no longer in pain. They're no longer suffering, but your heart still hurts. When a relationship is over, even if you knew it wasn't a healthy one, it was toxic, your heart still hurts, right? Because it is a living, breathing, feeling, thinking organ. And that's what we have to do is make this connection between the heart and the mind, right? Mm -hmm. And what's in between? Our mouths, yeah. right? So the words that we use, how we speak to one another, the tones, the inflections, how we communicate, right? That is so critical to taking us to the next level of being really just incredible human beings. I love it. Kara, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. I appreciate this conversation. And, you know, ultimately, I think it's, it's the ability to have more conversations openly and saying, it really does its values. Now, I don't have to decide your values, but if we have the conversation, man, it's amazing how much further we can get. Um, that's been an experience I've had. That's been an experience that I champion. And um, I truly see it from what you're sharing. It's, a, it's getting those values and making them heart centric so they can go back through to our head. So our mouth isn't saying what really isn't the case. Yeah. Thank you again so much. We'll make sure in the show notes, catch everything that you have, uh, Inversity, also your book. And uh, thank you again so much. Thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Value. Well, that's it, simply. We, we ended with that. Kareth suck, talked so much about value. And that's my belief. If we focus on values... What are your values? I'm lucky to spend so much time with John Maxwell. John Maxwell in his book, Change Your World. John Maxwell and his entire program for students in, you know, whether developing countries through um, the John Maxwell Leadership Foundation or what they're doing here in the United States. It's focusing and teaching and discussing values. Here's what I know is the basis of values comes from a background which is very religious based because that was the model of societies to very, you know, agrarian based, based upon what people, how they operate and navigate it. And it's when we as a society start to have those conversations, what values, what are the values? What do those values mean to me? We can start having those conversations in our organizations. Man, I believe that along with what Kareth is sharing, this inversity being inclusive, not dividing, not saying there's something wrong with you, but finding what value people have. If we lead like that, if we infuse our organizations with that, man, we'll have more people with diverse, varied backgrounds want to be a part of your organization than ever before. And the amount of growth that will come from that will be unbelievable. Again, thanks for being here. I appreciate you subscribing, you listening. Um, I appreciate seeing that, you know, the show continues to grow. That means you're getting value. I'm going to keep trying to get better. I love your comments, your feedback. How can I get better? What area can I speak on? What can we talk about? One thing I do know is that when we all communicate together, we all get better. So again, thanks for being here. Hit that subscribe button. If you got value from today, share, go see more about Kareth. Uh, I know her work is impactful, and if it fits into your organization, man, I know she would appreciate it and would be great as well. Make sure to check everything in the show notes to see more about her, to watch her TED Talk, and uh, till next time, have a good one.